Can you mush this? Oh, no, it's okay. Thank you. All right, let's continue with uh, fundamentals. We covered a lot of uh, like theoretical stuff in basic classes last week. So a few more concepts I want to uh, hack our way through before we boot the server and start making some sound. So next up is a class called Array. So an array is quite simply an ordered collection of things. It is a very handy class, very useful for all sorts of things. Uh, the general reason why arrays are useful is because they allow us to express a collection of many things as one singular thing. And we have the ability to look up and extract and add and remove and you know, just basically deal, deal with a bunch of things all in one single ordered collection. So arrays can be useful for holding uh, uh, you know, a, a pitch set, right? a bunch of pitches, or a set of metric values, or uh, you know, the, the sky is the limit here. It's just, it's just a lot easier than having a bunch, like, you know, 50 unique variable names for unique. Just put them all in an array, and there you go. So uh, let's, let's just make a very simple array here. Sorry, I, want, I meant to increase my font size here. Uh, let's just, uh, now in, in some languages, you, um, you need, like, arrays can only contain one type of information, like only integers or only floats or something like that. In SuperCollider, arrays can contain any combination of different data types. So I'll just put a few things in here. Um, um, so here's a completely useless array full of stuff. Uh, some things we can do with arrays is we can say, how big are you? We can say, you know, the, the array dot size. That tells us how many items are present. Uh, other things we can do with an array are similar to what we can do with strings. Uh, we can reverse. We can scramble. Right. So reverse reverses the order. Scramble randomizes the order. None of these things. Are, this is a very silly example. But, uh, one thing that is more useful is the ability to say, give me the item stored in this array at a particular location. And that location is called an index. And indices begin with zero. It's a very important thing to remember. Even though there are six things in this array, their indices are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So if we say, give me the item at index 3, this will return, you tell me. Seven. Right, the number 7. Uh, as a syntactical shortcut to the at method, we can simply say the variable containing the instance of the array and then without any period, uh, just left square bracket, sorry, the, the index, I got confused with the index and the item. Uh, and then the, we just want the array and then in square brackets, the index. So this is, this is the same thing. Uh, there are a lot of methods and sh syntactical shortcuts associated with the array class and many of them are very valuable and worth learning. Uh, there are two resources I'll point you to. One on the course website is my array cheat sheet, which is something you can download. It's a quick read. And also companion code 1.1 is very similar. In fact, I think one of them is based on the other. So there's a lot of content overlap. You probably don't need to read them both. Um, but if I were to recommend one, it would probably be the companion code 1.1. In the, in the book, there's, I sort of interrupt and say, take a moment to look at the companion code just to get comfortable with arrays. To give you a little bit of a taste, uh, if we want to make an array of all, of all of the integers from 1 to 100, we have a couple of different ways to do that. Um, we can just say 1 dot dot 100 in parentheses, and that will fill in the rest. If we want to do, um, if we want to sort of do only the odd numbers, we can say something like this: one uh, in parentheses, one comma three dot dot one hundred. Um, of course, we could just do ninety nine here. That's the same result. Um, and then there's also the array class, and so there's various creation methods. Uh, creation class methods that are applied to the class named array rather than instances of the array. So we can say array.series and three things we need, the size of the array, the starting value, and the step increment. So this is uh, 100 numbers starting at 1 and incrementing by 1 
every time. So this gives us the same result. Uh, yeah, lots, lots and lots of options here. The, the array is actually a lot like the string class. Uh, if you remember strings, uh, you know, we can say, you know, the strings have a size, and we can say, give me uh, the item at index 2. This is the first lowercase l. Um, the difference, one of the big differences between strings and arrays is that uh, strings uh, can only contain an order collection of characters, a class called care, C -H, capital C-H-A-R. Um, you, you might see characters every now and then as like, uh, uh, you know, the way we express them is, is with uh, preceding the character by a dollar sign. This is a syntactical representation of characters. But arrays, are, they're, they're similar in some ways, except that they don't have to contain only characters. They can contain anything. So uh, I don't know if there's necessarily that much more to say about arrays, um, but I will enthusiastically direct you to the supplementary code materials on arrays so that you can kind of get comfortable with them. Um, I, here's, here's, a, here's a very brief musical example. Let's say we want to uh, generate uh, four random, uh, uniquely random notes that belong to the key signature of E flat major. Right? We just want to, we want to generate like a little four note chord that, that is diatonically, uh, you know, a part of that collection. So um, uh, let's see. Actually, I think I, I am getting a little bit ahead of myself because we might want to come back to this when we talk about functions. But well, no, not, let's do it. So let's just, um, I'm just going to make an array, which is, uh, these numbers just simply represent semitones, arbitrarily normalized to zero being the starting pitch. And if you know your scales, then you'll probably recognize this as um, the notes in a major scale. You know, if, if this is C, this is D, E, F, etc. Right? And so one, one thing we can do here is say, uh, if we want to, if, if we consider 0 to be C, which, which makes sense because, you know, all of the multiples of 12 are considered C in the MIDI scheme. So the first thing we'd probably want to do is add three to everything. And what's nice here is that regular old addition is defined for arrays um, just as it is for regular numbers. Um, you know, there, there are some questions that come up here when you add a number to an array. Uh, the main question being what actually happens, right? And the default behavior is to apply this operation to every item in the array. So this gives us, it just sort of bumps everything up by three. So now we're in the key of E flat major. And then uh, to pick four unique pitches, we can first uh, scramble the array. And then we have a, like, if we want to just, now that it's scrambled, we can just sort of take the first four or the last four, and those are guaranteed to be four unique pitches that belong to this pitch collection. Uh, so let me see if I remember this. Uh, if we say at, um, the array, 0 to 3. Right? So remember, this expression here, the inner set of parentheses, uh, evaluates to the array 0, 1, 2, 3. And we're saying, uh, give me the items uh, at these indices. So that's, this, this is the result of that evaluation. The first thing we did is we define this array. We add 3 to each value. We randomize it and take the first 4. And that happened to be 12, 14, 3, and 5. Uh, an, another option we can do is uh, x.keep4, I think. And uh, let me just let's see. It, just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post ln on this scramble. And this is, this is like a, a print command. It will just print to the post window the result of this line. And then it'll return the last line. So this is. Um, so this is, we get a quick snapshot of our program in progress right after we scramble the array. And we can see that the keep option keeps the first four items. That's what we actually return here. 
So it's not the greatest musical example in the world because we're not actually making any sound. We're just sort of juggling numbers, but you get the idea. It's, it's nice to be able to work with arrays because they let us track collections of things and that's very useful. Okay, uh, any, any thoughts or questions on arrays? It's a pretty basic class. I think you'll, you'll encounter them a lot, so it's good to get comfortable with them. Mm -hmm, right here. Uh, okay, so this, um, I'll, I'll excerpt this. Um, you're, you're wondering about this expression? Yes. Okay, so let's just, let's just make it even simpler. and We'll just make a, let's just do like a, uh, forget about that, forget about that. Um, the at, commonly when saying, you know, at, we're asking for an item at a specific index. So this, these two lines will return the number 40 because we're saying define this array and then give me the item at index two. Sometimes we want to extract a contiguous block of items. And so in that case, we can say, give me the item at uh, one comma two. This gives us the array 30, 40. It sort of reaches in there and looks at those indices and returns an array containing that contiguous block. I, I think we could even do something like this. You know, we just, it doesn't have to be contiguous. We could just say, give me an array containing items from this array X at the following indices, right? So just convenient that we can pull multiple items instead of having to do them individually. Yeah, yes. You might be, there is still a question because I'm not, I don't know about like coding that much, but the, the, all the things inside of the, like the parentheses, is it like starting from the uh, top to bottom, like all full set? You mean these parentheses here? Yeah. The very top and very bottom? Yes, yeah, so the question is, it, it, within these parentheses, well, two, two reactions to your question. One, these, these are sort of a convenience that allows us to evaluate multiple lines of code with a single keystroke without having to actually highlight everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if we didn't have these parentheses, mm -hmm. then there's no keystroke that will allow me to run them all at the same time, so I'd have to highlight them and do it that way. Uh -huh. uh, so the parentheses allow us to uh, delineate them as a singular unit and then command enter or control enter on Windows will run all of them. But yes, your, the other question, which is something I probably should have been more explicit about, uh, uh, the interpreter will uh, parse these lines in the order they appear from top to bottom. That's it's really just all computers work this way. They, they are given a set of instructions and they go through them one by one by one, piece by piece by piece. There's no way for Super Collider to like do this all at, all at the same time. It mm -hmm. sort of feels like it's doing it instantaneously, yeah. but really, if we were to go in super slow motion, it would you know, do this line first and store this array in this variable. Then it would add three to each item and overwrite the variable. So it's oh, doing all these things. Yeah, yeah. that's something that I was doing. Yeah, yeah this, this looks really weird because it looks mathematically yeah. false, right? You know, if x is a number, then this will this is not equal, right? But but the equal, the single equals in Super Collider and in many other languages, the equal sign corresponds to an assignment. We are saying the thing on the right, calculate that and store it or assign it to this named container or this variable. Right? So now x contains uh, something new. It's the oldest, the old assignment, each item plus three. And then again, the x now contains the old assignment with a randomized order of things. And this, this doesn't have any effect on the data, this just has the side effect of printing it in the post window. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's so clear. Great, okay. Excellent. From that result, keep the, last, the first four. Right, and then here, it's, I mean, we could, we could do this. There's nothing wrong with doing this. Okay. It's just that um, I, I, I'm, I just say I'm in the habit of, of relying on the fact that when you evaluate multiple lines of code, the last line is returned and, um, you know, but I think it actually might have been, this is like pedagogically a little bit more responsible, I think, just to, we're working with X and we're overwriting, overwriting, overwriting. Yeah, the, but just so, so in this case, if we check the value of X, we see that it is in fact this truncated array. If we don't assign and evaluate this, we see the result, but X is actually not that result. It, it contains this, 
we calculated the result of keeping only four, but we didn't store it in X. Okay? So subtle difference, but very important. Okay, so uh, let's move on from arrays and let's talk about functions. Okay, functions are a, a, a far-reaching concept. You will see them over and over again in SuperCollider. And in other programming languages, they might be known by different names, like subroutines, for example. Essentially, uh, okay, let's say we're going through our happy day of coding and making things, and we come up with a tiny little program which does something really useful, like converting um, you know, MIDI note numbers to pitch names, or converting durations measured in seconds into like uh, metric values, like quarter of a beat, or you know, some, something which does a, a computation which is not, not trivial, not as trivial as like adding two or something like that, but simple enough that we can express it in just two or three lines of code. Now, what's desirable is to be able to store that little modular piece of data processing in a singular unit so that it can be easily reused and repurposed and sort of propagated throughout your code, as opposed to having to type that information again and again and again and copy and paste it all over your, all over your program, right? So this is what functions allow us to do. They allow us to encapsulate some small or large um, bit of code which we can then evaluate on demand whenever and wherever we want. So to begin, uh, we will make a very dumb function of some sort. Okay, so we'll say, let's, and, and also it's good in a function, generally it's a good idea within a function to use local variables. Because the, the scope of the variables that we use inside of a function are going to be local to that function. We, we generally will not need to use them outside of that function, so let's not take up space with global variables which are prone to human error and like, you know, misnaming or, or just, you know, duplicating and things like that. So uh, I, I think it's always good to use local variables. We'll say um, num, short for number. We'll say num equals uh, eight, and we'll say uh, num equals num squared and num equals num minus one. Not a useful function, but easy to digest. And so we will run this, and you'll notice that what we see in the post window is not the number 63, but we see a function. This is SuperCollider's acknowledgement that we've created a function, so it knows what's in it, it knows how to do it, but it hasn't been told to actually do that function yet. It's just sort of sitting there in the global variable x, and you can see x now contains a reference to this function. So we're basically taking stuff we've done earlier, which is like writing code and evaluating code, which kind of happens at the same time. Functions allow us to separate those two steps. So we write some code, but don't evaluate it. And then later, you know, maybe much later, maybe immediately afterwards, we evaluate it. And there's, the way we do that is by calling value on the function. Value is kind of a, basically a message that says to SuperCollider, okay, now peek inside of that function and run that code. So the result of this expression returns, you know, whatever the function contents return. So at this point we could say, you know, a global variable um, actual num right, equals x dot value. Right? So there we go. Uh, there is a a syntax shortcut for this. Instead of x dot value, we can do x dot empty parentheses. This is the same thing. Okay, so the um, yeah, two, two things which do the same thing. You could also have um, parentheses here. That's also fine. We'll see. We'll see why in just a second. So this is a, a really dumb function because it doesn't actually do anything useful. It just... we. <laughs> We could do this all in our head and say, okay, why don't we just use the number 63? If that's if we're so desperate to produce the number 63, let's just use it. Why are we going to, you know, bother doing a bunch of math gymnastics just to get there? Uh, so, uh, a, a cornerstone of functions is the the idea that um, or the that they allow us to pass in a starting value, which is then processed by the contents of the function. So, you know, let's say we we didn't actually want we don't want the number eight every time. We want to be able to square and subtract one from an arbitrary number. You know, so how do we do that, right? Well, 
uh, a variable is, is kind of a very simplistic container. And so, you know, we, if we assign a hard value in the function, it's always going to be that value. So uh, uh, instead of a, a variable, we're going to make this an argument instead. And uh, uh, what I'm, well, let's see, if we, if we do it this way, now I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to take this, this away. We're not going to actually assign eight to the number because that kind of defeats the purpose of allowing us to do it ourselves. Okay, so now we've redefined this function. So if we evaluate the function now, what do you suppose is going to happen? Yeah, nothing is not technically correct, but nothing useful is correct. It's just going to say, hold, what, c come on, what is this? What is yeah, we say, here, define this container, which is a, 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 uh, an avenue for us to pass a starting number in, square it, and it says, no, 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 come on, you didn't give me a number. I don't know what this is. I can't square it. So this is why we have these parentheses, and we say, how about uh, 6, right? Ah, there we go. So, so when we evaluate this, uh, Superglider says, okay, we're, we're, we're given an input of six. It's going to get passed in, and num becomes six. Six is assigned to num. And then it proceeds with everything and returns the result. And when I say returns the result, I mean, you know, we can actually capture the output and store it in a, a global variable to be used somewhere else. Um, so, right, this, this returns six squared minus one. This returns 5 squared minus 1. This returns 0 squared minus 1. And again, we can just you know, remove it. This is such a common thing to do with functions that we don't even need to say value. We just say you know, the, the starting number, right? And then we just um, you know, x dot the, the value. Uh, and there is a syntax alternative to the arg statement, which is uh, instead of uh, saying arg, we can just put uh, a set of pipes. The pipe character is right below the delete character, shift, and you know that, that one that has the slash on it, the vertical line. Yeah. So this is this is the same thing. It does not need a semicolon, right? Yeah, and, and some people, I, I think, like to just put it right here on the first line, just write it. Again, SuperCollider is pretty indifferent to white space, so whatever feels stylistically nice to you, go for it. Uh, it is generally a good idea, not required, but generally a good idea, to provide a default value for your argument to fall back on in case you, this, for, in, this, in this case, we're not really implying anything. Like, it's not really clear what would be the most sensible default value because it's just abstract math, right? If it's some, some function which does something specific, like if it, like, plays a sine wave, you might want to default that to middle C or A440, you know, like in terms of frequency or something like that. But in this case, it, it doesn't really matter. But now we have the sort of um, benefit of if we evaluate without an input, the function no, it has a falls back on whatever we've given, so it's going to fall back on zero, unless we override that with some other number. Like if we plug one in, then it's okay. Forget about zero. We're going to use one instead. Right. <clears throat> and just to kind of combine uh, variables and arguments, because it is sometimes a little bit of a confusion. Like what's what's the actual difference? I mean, the, uh, at, at a basic level, arguments within the context of a function allow us to pass custom values in. Variables can't interact with the outside world in that way, but they are still useful containers to just contain stuff. So, you know, we might uh, make an argument and then declare some, this is kind of overkill, but we could declare some variables and say input is going to be our input argument. And then we're going to say output equals input dot squared and then output equals output minus one. And then, you know, if you want to be, you know, really explicit, you can say output at the end of the function, just to be extra clear that this is the thing that comes out of the function. So number is our input argument, the thing we can customize when we call the function. It defaults to zero. 
we have this pair of containers, the input to the function is num, and then, the, then we start calculating the output by squaring the input, storing it in output, and then modifying output so it's one fewer, and then return the output. So this is just the exact same function. All right, so all right, one squared minus one, eight squared minus one, and so this is, I mean, really what I'm kind of showing you here is that there's uh, many stylistic variations on how verbose you want to be, how concise you want to be. You know, you don't, you see, we can, we can do something very simple like this. This is a little bit more wordy, but maybe a little bit more clear. It's kind of up to you to decide. So um, let's, here's a, here's a fun exercise. I don't know about fun is the right word, but <laughs> here's, here's an exercise relating to something we did earlier with this here, right? So we did this little thing where we can pick a, a major key signature and generate four numbers that belong to that key signature. So let's build a function that does that. And we'll start. What, what should we name it? What's a good name for this function? I'll, I'll, I'll break the ice here. We'll call it make, <laughs> make notes. How's, how's that? Okay, so make notes is going to be a, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a, I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> okay, so and now here, before we start coding, you know, this is, imagine this is like kind of a mini homework exercise. Before you start typing, you really want to be able to express what this function is going to do in regular language, just in plain English or whatever language you speak. Um, so we want to ask, like, wh what are the inputs to this function? Like, I suppose we need to know the, you know, the root pitch of the key signature. And we can express that as just a, a, a number, like zero would be C major, one would be C sharp major, et cetera. Right, so we can say uh, uh, root will default to C major. And let's make a variable called scale, which is going to be this thing that we will just copy and paste. All right. And so now what we need to do is transpose the scale by the root value, which is simply scale equals scale plus zero. Sorry, root. What am I doing? Scale equals scale plus root, right? And you might think, okay, why are we doing that? Root is zero. Ah, it might be zero, it might not be zero. This is a value that we get to decide when we perform the function. So we, we always want to apply this operation, even if it is zero. And then uh, I guess we could even make another variable. Results, or we'll call it notes. And the notes are going to be scale.scramble.keep4. I'm combining these two operations into one line, because why not? I think this, this isn't like you know, too, too cluttered for my taste. It's, we, we scramble it, and then we keep four. OK, so there's our function. And now we want to say make notes dot, uh, let's just pick a, what, what key do we want to be in here? D flat, so D flat would be one. D flat would be one, right? There we go. And so this is, um, what is this, uh, E flat. Uh, G flat, uh, this is C, and this is B flat, right? So that's, those are all in D flat major. Right? Uh, so a couple of um, thoughts occur to me here. Uh, this, this is valid to have two separate lines with two separate local variable declarations. We also have the option to just combine this into one statement like this. So we say, a, we, we say var, a space, and then we start naming variables and optionally assigning values to them. And then we can put some more here. Now notes, notes doesn't really make sense to assign a value because we're, that's kind of the whole point of the function is to calculate and assign some value to that. Uh, and again, Right. This is also, this is the syntactic alternative that we saw, same thing. When you're writing a function and it has arguments and variables, arguments must come first, then variables, then everything else. You can't declare a new variable 
somewhere in the middle or an argument somewhere in the middle. They have to go at the top. What if we wanted to not always generate uh, four pitches from our desired collection, but an arbitrary number of pitches? How would we do this? Because right now, we have hard-coded four into this function, which means we will always produce an array of size four, assuming there's enough pitches in the collection. Do we have an array inside of that parentheses already, or? Not quite. Not there's, quite. No, so I, what I'm asking is I, I want to be able to, on a whim, when I call the function, uh -huh. specify an arbitrary number of pitches in the resulting collection. So what do we do? Well, we already have this argument to specify an arbitrary transposition. And now I also want this to be an arbitrary value, maybe three pitches, maybe two pitches. Oh, so we also create that as an argument. We make another argument, exactly. right. That we can maybe name it number. So yeah, sure. We'll default to four. Why not? And then here we replace this permanent four with num notes. OK? Yes. Um, as a matter of, if, if I want to use the two big lines, yeah. how do I put those two arguments together? Also, with just a comma after the Yep, two? and no semicolon at the end. Oh, good, perfect. Yep. You. All your arguments go in an enclosure of pipes like that. Yeah. yeah. So let's run this. And so now we can specify comma separated values for the arguments, and they will be interpreted in the same order in which they were declared. So let's just say C major for simplicity. And then we'll say 3 instead. So this now gives us uh, an array of three random pitches from C major. And here's uh, two random pitches from F sharp major, and so on and so forth. And I, I'm sure that there's probably lots of ways to break this. Like, uh, you know, if we say, give me. 42 numbers. I, it, there aren't that many, right? So it's, you know, this, this is like, uh, give me 42 pitches. Well, you know, we only started with a, a single octave's worth of notes. So, um, you know, this, so th at this point, you sort of ask yourself, does this function do, does it meet the threshold for what I need it to do? If so, maybe you can just kind of move on, um, you know. But for example, I, I don't even know what happens if you put like a negative number in here. Maybe it, maybe it truncates at the other end of the array. Or something like that. We don't really know. But the, you know, if, if you were to give me this on a homework assignment, I would give you full credit. It's, it's perfectly fine. There's no obvious problems with it. Uh, you have the ability to customize the key signature and the number of notes we end up with. And you know, other questions might come up like, okay, what about octave transpositions? These are always going to be in the same octave, and it's always going to be shifted up rather than down. So you know, depending on how specific you want to be with your pitch generating code, you'll have to do a little bit more work to juggle your numbers in order to get the right results. But um, hopefully you sort of get the right idea with functions here. So any anytime you find yourself copying and pasting the same code like over and over and over again, stop what you're doing <laughs> and write a function that does that. Because then whenever you want to perform that action, instead of having to copy and paste and do all this again, you just say, make notes. And then out come your notes. OK, so that's functions. Uh, let's move on to a, a slightly more theoretical concept, which is uh, literals. So this is a, a literal is not really a, technically a class the way like integer and float are type of class. But a literal, and when you say literal, you're referring to an object which has a literal syntactic representation. So examples include integers, floats, strings, um, symbols. These are things which we, we can just sort of write them out as is in the code. Um, there are lots of other classes where we don't have that option because there is not a syntactical character representation of that object. An example is the knob. If we say knob.new.front, we, we get a knob. It's over here. It's really small, but we can make it big. Right? 
And so uh, uh, we actually have to use explicitly the knob class and say, hey, knob class, dot new. So this, this expression returns a new instance of a knob, and then front makes that instance visible. And this knob doesn't do anything interesting, right? Um, but this is a knob is a, an example of a class that is not a literal because we actually have to use the code abstraction in order to generate one of these. Um, now there is an integer class. You know, there's a class called integer. But can you imagine if every time we needed the number seven, we had to do integer dot new seven, right? And this was the way to create the number seven. It would be really obnoxious. Uh, so you know, there's there's classes like these which are used so commonly that we don't need to do the dot new business, but most classes we encounter, like sine waves, pink noise generators, graphical windows, sliders and knobs, these things, we can't literally represent them with code, so we have to symbolically represent them using their class name and through methods and things like that. Uh, array is an example of a class which actually has a literal and non-literal representation. Uh, I mean, there there is, um, I mean, you, you can write out uh, a, an array with just just like this, and technically a literal array is one which has a, a hash symbol before the array, uh, and this this basically cr produces an array that is as static as an integer or a float, where it's just kind of a singular thing that can't be changed. Um, so this is a, a non-literal array, but you can also do um, array creation, you know, like uh, fill an array with five eights or something like that, right? So array has a representation through traditional code, but it can also be written out explicitly. Uh, th the point I'm making here is that you should, uh, the, the sort of the general workflow for most objects is to say, give me a new thing and then uh, do a thing with, that's, I'm not gonna use thing twice, do stuff, right? This, this is kind of, you know, Right. Uh, this is the, the sort of creation line where we say, I would like a new instance of thing, which we don't have a symbolic representation for, so we use code. And you might put in some, some starting information, like how big the thing is, or how wide the thing is, or how fast the thing is, right? Things to define the attributes of the new instance we're creating. And then once we have that instance stored in a variable, we can then do stuff to it, you know? So this is, this is like the usual way of working with code. But a lot of the stuff we've seen so far is different and unique because we have this literal representation. So, uh, I feel like there might have been one more thing. Oh, yeah, on, on this topic, we have, let, let's do a, 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 a still like syntactically invalid but more meaningful example. I think I have an example like this uh, in, in the book where, let's, where we want to make a house. Right? We don't have a house character, so we use the house class. And we'll say, you know, its, it's footprint is like, 40 feet by 50 feet or whatever, right? So this obviously doesn't do anything because there isn't a house class. But we can imagine there's a house class. And then if we want to, um, you know, get the length of that house, like which, which is, you know, if we say length by width, we can say x dot length. And this will would return the number 40, right? This, ignore the error, this action here is called getting. We want to get some attribute of an object. Now let's say we've created this house, but then we want to uh, do some remodeling. We want to actually extend the width by 10 feet or something. We can say x dot width uh, underscore 60. Right? So this line would, this is called setting, getting and setting. This is, we are setting the width attribute of our house instance to be 60. Right? And so if we do this, and then we evaluate x dot width, it would return 60, right? So just to reiterate here, this is the creation of a house instance. This is getting the length, setting the width, and getting the width. You can even combine these. We can say set the width to the current width plus 10, right? And this is kind of interesting. The, this line here, we could evaluate repeatedly, and each time we do, we lengthen the width of the house by 10 units, right? Boom, 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 boom. We can just keep doing that. So, um, yeah, two, two concepts here, the, the idea of literals and non-literals, and then getting and setting. These are things we'll see 
throughout. Okay, two more things I want to cover, and I'm going to try to be brief here and refer you all to the book to, for the finer details. But uh, first, I want to talk about randomness. Computers are very good at doing things which are acceptably random seeming to humans. It's not actually random, it's deterministic, but it's just a very complicated deterministic algorithm that feels like randomness to us. So a couple of methods. Uh, Rrand, which is short for ranged random, uh, will generate a random number between the minimum and maximum that you provide. Uh, if they are both integers, the result will be an integer. If one or both is a float, the result will be floats. Exp rand is uh, similar, but uh, whereas R rand produces a uniform distribution where each item in the range is equally likely to be chosen, exp rand produces an exponential range. So uh, the way to think of this is imagine a sort of a straight line, y equals x, and then imagine you know uh, y equals x squared or, or 2 to the x or something, where the, the curve kind of bends downward. I'll just, just draw this for you. So if we have like, you know, this is like, that's a perfectly straight line or something like that. So, uh, you know, you, you put in some, some the random value that's going to fall, you know, somewhere on this line. Everything's kind of equally likely to be chosen. Uh, uh, exponential distribution is going to look more like this. So it's going to, you know, if we look at, if we just put a random number on this line, they're going to be kind of clustered around the low end of this output range. So if we say x brand uh, 1 to 100, we're going to get a lot of numbers that are kind of in the single digits. Let's see, we just got like two, two ones in a row. We have a, a 1 here, 6, 1. Right? This is useful because some musical parameters we have a logarithmic perception of, like frequency and amplitude. Um, so exponentially picking random numbers for those parameters will sound perceptually evenly distributed, even if they are numerically not uniformly distributed. Uh, the Rrand, these, these can be any numbers. They can cross zero. They can be zero. They can be negative. They can be negative and positive. But Xbrand, both numbers need to have the same sign, and neither can be zero. So if you put in a, a zero, we get not a number, N-A-N, and we also can't cross zero. So these, these just have to be the same sign. And X brand will always generate floats, even if the min and max are integers. Um, but we can always just do something like as integer, which will convert the float to an integer. I think it does that by just removing the decimal point and everything after it. Uh, real quick with uh, with arrays, um, if we want to create uh, if we want to create an array of copies of the same thing, like if we have uh, the number five, we can say dot dupe, and then a number. This will create an array containing four fives. We take the number five, we duplicate it four times, uh, and we I frequently find myself wanting to create. Uh, arrays of random numbers. And so you might be tempted to, you know, do this. So it looks like we're uh, duplicating this random number thing, but what happens here is that we, again, we're just going left to right. So this happens first. We generate a random number, and then we duplicate it eight times. So we, do, we can do this multiple times. It's going to be a random number every time, but it's always eight copies. The way we get around this is by enclosing the thing we want to duplicate, wow, I cannot type today, in curly braces, um, creating a function. And the reason this works is because functions respond to duplication a little bit differently than other objects. Specifically, we're not duplicating the function. We are saying, hey, function, evaluate yourself eight times and populate an array with those results. So this, this gives us the more expected result of eight uniquely generated random numbers. And there is a shortcut for dupe, which is the exclamation point. So instead of dot dupe, parentheses eight, we can just do 
exclamation point eight. And in many videos of mine, I, I have no space here, but I, I have since uh, changed my mind and I feel like it's the same as like plus and minus and multiply and divide, so I like space here now. Anyway, that's, that's duplication. This is super easy because as we get into synthesis, we'll see that using this dupe shortcut, we can very easily generate a cluster of like 500 oscillators all at random frequencies and it's like a one-liner and it's just the most satisfying thing you'll ever do in SuperCollider. Okay, and I, I'm gonna go as fast as I can into this last, oh, there's two more things. Oh, shoot, okay. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll ask you to read uh, about conditional logic, uh, which is essentially if, then, else, you know, creating branching things that you generate a random number and you want to say, if it's greater than this, do the following thing, otherwise do that thing. And that's useful for a variety of reasons when you're writing a program. You know, for example, if you, you know, you have a, a piece and it's playing and you want to say, if three minutes have elapsed, move on to section B or something like that, right? So you would, you could just have this process which is continually checking the time and saying, okay, false, 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 oh, three minutes, true. And then we switch over to the next part of the program. So. Um, yeah, take a look at that. And so the, just uh, the last thing I want to cover, yeah, please, please do read about conditional logic, uh, is the concept of iteration. So iteration refers to the uh, automation of some repetitive task. Uh, in programming, it's very common where we'll want to do something a bunch of times in a row. Um, you know, for example, we might have uh, a collection of pitches and we want to uh, transpose each one up by some amount. And we've kind of already seen this. We see we can just add three to an array and it transposes it. So this is not the, the greatest example, but let's say uh, we have this array and we want to uh, transpose each pitch randomly by either two semitones or three semitones. Right. So we can't do this. It seems like it might work, right? Okay, we'll just add a random number that's either two or three to this x. But this isn't going to work because, again, this operation happens only once. And we're going to say, okay, x plus whatever that number is, two or three, add it to each number. So, you know, for example, this, this just adds three to every number. Right? <clears throat> So there are two iteration methods that I think are very useful. They are do and collect. They're similar with a slight difference. Uh, so let's, let's uh, copy this, bring it down here. Uh, let's start with collect, actually. So collect uh, requires a function. And what collect is going to do is it's going to perform this function once for each item in the, in the thing being collected on. And it's going to return a new collection of the same size in which each item is the result of this function. Let's, let's, uh, let's do a really um, dumb example first. <laughs> Just put the number five here. Uh, what this does is we, we define our collection and then collect is going to take each item and return the result of this function, which is five, and stick the result of that function in the array. So we're just going to get an array of all fives. This is a terrible idea. Just, we've just ruined our, our pitch collection. So generally what we want to do here is pass in each item from the collection, do something with it in the function, and then spit out the result and it gets automatically plugged back into the same spot at a new array. So the way we pass items in is by declaring an argument. And we'll say item. Item equals item plus our rand 2 comma 3. I don't think we even need this assignment here. We just need to return the thing we want to return. And just, just for clarity, let's post the item. So in this block of code, we define an array and we iterate over the array using collect. Uh, so this collect function is going to get performed seven times because there are seven items in the array. 
So on the first performance of this function, item is zero. We post it, you'll see zero in the post window, and then we return that item plus either two or three. And then you can imagine collect in the back of its mind is, is, has this uh, array of size seven, which is empty, and it's going to plug the first thing in there, or technically the zeroth thing in there. And then it's going to move on to the next item, which is two. It's going to return two plus randomly two or three, and so on and so forth. So let's just run this. And so as you can see, collect has executed this function seven times, once for each item in the starting collection. And one thing that this function does is just post the input. And so the input is zero on the first time, then two, then four, then five. And it's just the starting numbers here. And it adds a random number, either two or three, to each one. And here's our new collection. So it added two to zero. It added two to four. It added two to six. It added three to five. Sorry, it added two to four. It added three to three to five. You you see where I'm going? Right? Yeah, okay, yeah. Two to seven. Yeah. And if we run this again, we get a different result. Right? So now we, we're we're kind of doing a sort of irregular transposition where we're kind of shifting the major scale in an unpredictable way. And maybe this might sound really cool. Who knows? Right? Uh, so that's that's collect. Collect returns uh, a new collection. And so actually, we could say you know y equals this thing. So if we, if we run this now, uh, we can see that x um, is still its starting self. x is unmodified. But y now contains the result of this collect operation, which is 3, 5, 7, 7, et cetera, et cetera. Right? <clears throat> and real quick, and just to uh, show you the difference, uh, no, actually, two things. Uh, no, we'll, we'll keep it simple. Let's just say, so do is another iteration method similar to collect. Do is different from collect in the following way. Collect returns a modified collection based on the function. Do always returns its receiver. Remember, receiver.method. So x.do, receiver.method. X is the receiver of do. Do will perform these actions here, but it will return X. And so when we run this, uh, we see that you know it, it's done the thing, and X it, it posted each item, and you can see it actually returned the starting collection. So Y is just a copy of X. And you might think, why is this why is this useful? Uh, and I think generally speaking, collect is the more flexible of the two in that it, it actually can take a collection, modify it, and give you back the result. Do is just kind of useful if you just want to, uh, if you're more interested in like whatever happens inside the function, you're less concerned about getting a new thing back. So if you just want to, um, uh, let's see, uh, if we have this, this collection here and we just want to say, um, you know, we dot post ln. Maybe we just want to print we seven times. Uh, so we can do that. And there really is no point in even saving the result of do because we already have the thing that it's going to return right here. So this will just post we seven times. Why would we want to do this? I'm not sure. But uh, uh, there's sort of the, the, the difference here is, is the, the concept of returning a value and the, concepts, the concept of some, doing some side effect. Like a, a better example would be to like, uh, I don't know, do, do something like uh, change the color of something in, a, in an interface, like a, like, a, like a window or a knob or, or just some visual effect, some sound effect, something off to the side that we, can, we just want to do X number of times. And, and do is very useful for doing that. And that way we don't have to worry about what this function actually returns. This just means we, we just do it based on the size of the collection. And the stuff that happens in here is responsible for creating the results that we want elsewhere in the program. Collect is useful when we actually want to mess with the receiver in some way and give us back a new value. These are, these are kind of subtle concepts, I think, that take a little bit of time to digest. Um, but hopefully they will become clear uh, 
as you read through the, the chapter and, uh, and start working on the homework. And my advice would be take a look at the homework now. It's due in a week, but just, just digest sort of what's expected of you rather than, you know, you might look at it and think, okay, I can knock this out in the last 24 hours, no problem, right? You might look at it and think, ooh, this last one's tricky. I, I should probably start thinking about that now. So, so do take a look. And, um, and I guess that's it. So we'll move on to sound, booting the server and making some bleeps and bloops next week. You know, very exciting. You know. All right, so stick around if you got questions, and um, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, Eli. Yeah, yeah.